very well performed. It, it's just a, a little bit uh, a broader spectrum. I mean, the things Carl Marsh did, um, the, the way the band was doing, I mean, things like Dream Lover, the way that works rhythmically, it's very sophisticated music, but if you listen to it, if it came out today, I, I, I think it was just a little ahead of its time. I, I, I think it's a very, if you go back and listen to it with fresh ears, it, it's very solidly played and solidly recorded. I mean, there may be some guitars feeding back, there may be a cowbell coming in, bang, 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 out of nowhere, but these are, are, are good musical choices all the way across the board. Um, I actually was coming down here to, I, I, I have a dream of getting maybe Carl to redo the orchestration for that record and perform it, uh, because it, it, it seems so performable to me, and it, to me it seems like the concert music of, our, of my generation. Um, but I, I just do not think that record is a weird record. I think right. it moves us because there's a lot of hard work that went into it. I wasn't at the bars, I don't know experience <laughs> of making it, but, but it just seems like a... It got a couple of funny reviews when it came out, but, uh, you know, gosh, you listen to it and it's precise and beautiful. The singing's great, right. you know, so I think we need to change our opinion of it. That, that's I agree. I agree with you. I mean, we, uh, we didn't think about it right that way. We actually thought these guys were going to be interested in it. But, you know, we got this amazing universal pushback. No label wanted to even consider touching. And, uh, you know, if you listen on the Big Star uh, box set, there are some acoustic demos that Alex did for a lot of the songs uh, uh, that were on Sister Lover's Third. And you listen to those acoustic demos and see how, just him and the acoustic guitar, how fully formed yeah. the arrangements and things were in his mind and how, how uh, uh, you know, it, it, certainly in the recording process, there was kind of an atmosphere uh, an un unusual atmosphere sometimes, <laughs> but 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 you get those demos and the songwriting you did, did, and just just li listen to those things. You can you can hear practically the whole ultimate recorded arrangement just in the end of the acoustic guitar. Um, in talking, and I, I feel like we've been covering a lot of history, so we want to tell some stories and, and anecdotes about Alex as well. And, and getting into this period, Chris, uh, there was a period where Alex eventually left uh, Memphis. Um, you know, in 76 or 77, I believe. Um, I moved to New York in January of 77, and a, a couple of weeks later, I got a call from Terry Ork, who, uh, there was a record called Singing Out the Song, that, an EP, and he said, Alex is coming up to play on Valentine's Day, and could you put a band together? And uh, I can't, you're talking about the lunar landing, but for me, this was uh, <laughs> uh, uh, impossible to take in. Nevertheless, uh, I knew one drummer, Alex was coming up. I auditioned by him asking me when the day I was born. And I kind of set up Tina Weymouth because he wanted a woman to play bass, but then he thought I would do. Um, he played the Valentine's Day show, and it actually was a great fun. We got a good review, and he pretty much didn't leave. I mean, he, we had a cot. My girlfriend and I were in a rented room, and he just stayed for about a year. And uh, I don't know if I'm even answering your question. No, but no, that's... It, it was... Um, uh, nothing I'd ever deserved, but it was a great mentor, and it was not uh, this, again, it was not a drunken weekend that lasted a year in my, it was, it was we talked about songwriting, he wrote a lot of great songs in that time, we, we uh, went up to the studio, often in Connecticut, recorded a lot, he showed me some of what John Fry had shown him, about how compressors work, different techniques, and Later on in the year, I think he became, it was good that he went back from Memphis, to Memphis at a certain point. Well, and of course, now you have Alex Chilton in the context of, of New York City, you know, in 1977, in the context of punk and what was going on there. And, you know, t talk a little bit about him during that period, because you played some and, and were obviously... Working. Well, we started out playing the Big Star catalog a lot, and we were doing, uh, we would do Kangaroo, or we could do Holocaust as well, and uh, watch the sunrise. And then, you know, we were playing at CBGB's, and... Texas, Kansas City, and it would slowly start to shift. Um, he, he was writing, you know, he still loved Lou Reed a lot and was writing more story songs uh, like My Rifle. And uh, so, you know, his music did change a lot during that period. And I think he was more interested in, I, I saw it as more cinematic, almost like, uh, not that he ever liked Robert Altman that I know, but kind of setting up situations in the studio instead of just dictating what the notes would be. Um, he had just moved on to a different kind of writing. Um, 
I, I don't know. But he was still doing really, like, we recorded a version of uh, I'm Your Handyman, I think, you know that song? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was pretty straightforward, but great. You know, he sang the hell out of it. We drove up to Connecticut, worked all night. It was like, I remember coming, the sun was coming up. Uh, maybe it was five in the morning. We're driving back after having recorded the hit, you know? And we're listening to the radio, and James Taylor comes on the radio singing, I'm your handyman, and just kind of pulled the rug out from under us there. And then the next thing we're doing is Bangkok, and it kind of moves a, lo a little different direction. Um, the, we'll jump, jump around here. I was talking backstage to Chris and, and, you know, had been talking to Tommy earlier. And, you know, one of the things about uh, Alex uh, in these years and in, in years uh, later was, you know, he became uh, uh, notorious for his personality in some ways and, and, and on occasion abrading uh, a sound man or two. Tommy was telling a, a funny story, which I found out what the genesis of it was. Tommy, tell, tell the story that you had, I don't know if it was when you were on tour or if you had heard this, but... Uh, uh, well, I, I, I did uh, about, I think, 12 or 15 shows uh, in 87, opening solo for him, and he had the combo. And uh, there were a lot of experiences like this, but Peter Buck actually told me this time, uh, around that time, that he was playing the Uptown Lounge in Athens. And uh, I guess Alex was notorious for just showing up five minutes before the gig, putting his guitar down, tuning up, and let's go, you know, kind of. So uh, the mic was feeding back, and even though the club was full, the sound man threw the talkback mic through the monitors, but everyone in the <laughs> club could hear him. And he, Alex said something like, Mr. Sound Man, it's really not cool, you know, feedback or something. And the, the guy says, next time, show up for sound check, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> So the upshot of that story is I'm talking to Chris, and, and Alex could be very uh, amusing in, in doing that, and t tell the story about yeah, Mingus. I think a lot of my understanding of Alex is he rarely did things arbitrarily. You just not, might not have the key to the code, like him doing uh, What's Your Sign may seem like an arbitrary choice, but he was very interested in astrology, you know. Uh, um, but uh, we both loved Charlie Mingus, and our friend Karen Berg had tickets. We went down to the Village Gate to see Charles Mingus play. And, uh, you know, he was great. Uh, after about 15 minutes, he started taking a solo. And in the middle of the solo, he stopped playing. And he said, hey, Mr. Soundman, I can't hear the, and he was an expletive, monitors. You've got to get it together. You know, and cursed out the sound man. And Alex and I looked at each other like. <laughs> and that, that a figure, you know, a great American composer would be on our level to say, like, I can't hear the monitors. And then it was, for years, I saw him do this on stage. He, could, he would go into this thing, hey, Mr. Soundman, I can't hear the monitors. And I'm telling you, it came from this show with Charlie Mingus. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, so it was like a, he would do these things that had a lot of meaning within his life, you know. We might not know what they were, but I think that one was right. When we uh, ran into each other uh, yesterday or day before, whenever you told me a story about well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story about Frank Riley, because <clears throat> I, I, I was talking to Frank about Chris singing in with us t uh, tonight, and uh, Frank said, yeah, definitely Chris Damey. Chris Damey's the one that handed me a little piece of paper with the name and phone number on it and said, you know, you really should call this guy, and it was, <clears throat> it was Alex's name and phone number, and uh, Frank runs high road touring and is... is, uh, is uh, kind of a celebrity in his own right, I think. Uh, <clears throat> but um, so, so Chris said, yeah, yeah, I died. I, and he, you told me the story about, it was 1982. Alex was at work washing dishes. Oh, you want to hear that one? Yeah, I actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought no, of this right funny, after no. he died. Uh, I, I've been, it's been awful. I, it's so sad. And I've been trying to think of funny things because he was so funny. And, uh, you know, Alex was, uh, what? Well, um, let me keep keep this. Uh, yeah, he'd, he'd been down in uh, New Orleans. I hadn't seen him for a while. We'd actually had a little falling out over uh, Panther Burns for uh, whatever reason. And um, he was telling me about working in the kitchen. I think he was washing dishes. And he said that he was saying some theory about the world. And uh, a guy he was working with turned around and said, uh, "Yeah, Alex, you're right, and the world's wrong." And then he looked at me, he paused for a minute, and I remember the way he looked, and he, he said, uh, you know, Chris, I really think he was on to something. <laughs> and, you know, he did, and he was. I mean, what can you say? 
Um, so, you know, the, the period uh, coming back, he came back to, and we alluded to it, and Alex came back to uh, 